that we have things that help illustrate this. This morning, we'll hear from um, Alessandro Benetton from a private equity viewpoint of how to create shared value. Uh, Vishal will talk to us about how venture capital can help achieve the same goals. And of course, we'll hear from CEO Roger Ferguson talking about TIAA, a large investment management company, and how it thinks about shared value. We'll hear from Deval Patrick tomorrow, uh, now running the Bain Double Impact Fund, but of course also having a background in both corporate work and in government. Then yesterday we ran a partner day because we have a year-round set of activities with all the partners of the Shared Value Initiative. And in that we worked on what we're calling a Shared Value Enterprise Model that really talks about how do we steward and foster the creation of shared value and the change process in the company. Again, embedding it in shared value. We also work on intellectual capital. And right now, one of the most interesting things we have going on, there's a breakout session that many of you are gonna attend, is how do we make the business case for ecosystem investments? Long-term investments that help craft and build, uh, build ecosystems for business success, but that require multi-sector activity. And then finally, we're proving shared value works on issues of importance. And tomorrow you hear from Kathleen McLaughlin, a very inspirational leader from Walmart, and our colleague Nicole Trimble talking about how we're doing work to activate HR systems within companies to really engage underserved opportunity youth in the United States in not only getting a job, but in what career pathways look like. Always as the shared value initiative that we are really trying to move from fragility to strength and shared value. So to continue with what's happening nowadays, uh, we are talking about an industry in renewables that are counting more or less investments each year in the last two years of more than 300 billion US and employing people all over, more or less uh, 9 million nowadays, all over the world. So we started at the time, was tough, uh, and we soon understood that to grow, most of all in the so-called emerging markets, uh, the old uh, um, corporate social responsibility approach was unfit, was not enough. And so we started, uh, we jumped into the creating shared value article, and we decided uh, to go straight into that methodology because what we did, uh, we customized internally and we started considering and taking into account, first of all, our value chain. And that was, let's say, the starting point because power took the edge of the group. It was 2014 and he soon decided to spread the same approach all over the group. It was not that easy, uh, as you can imagine, because we were talking about all thermal generation assets that are in operation and uh, that are making our EBITDA. But we start questioning. And the first question was quite simple, was uh, what is the role of a utility nowadays? Um, I think that this is the question that each single corporation dealing with a single and, and industry should, should ask uh, at a certain point. But that was the key turning point to understand that we need to change our strategy completely if we wanted to stay and on, not only stay, let's say, if we wanted to lead the energy sector in the next years, I mean, in the long run. And to set also the business purpose was crucial. And the business purpose, mm, just to sum it up and make it easy, it's quite simple to us. It's two simple words, open power. To us, open power means uh, opening energy access to more people. To more people and energy, energy should be clean, reliable, and affordable. And it goes straight to the second point, opening up to new technologies, because to have energy that is clean, reliable, and affordable, you should have a lot of innovation. And in most of the cases, innovation is not it's inside the company, it's outside the company. And outside the company, push a lot also the innovation inside the company. And then we said, okay, it's also the case to open up the energy 
new ways of energy so that people can also get the technology in their own hands to cope, for instance, with the issue of rural electrification in isolated areas. And last is open up to new partnerships. So this is the main frame, which is our strategy that is moving NL and will move in NL in the next years. And it's going to pay a lot. It's paid off a lot up to now. Uh, it's not over because uh, it's a path. It's a long journey. And this long journey um, also means that we are going to change during the path because there is a lot of complexity to take into account. And for instance, uh, the new challenge we are trying to face uh, nowadays uh, is also moving a little step further with our stakeholders. And so that's why the last question we are asking, in, we are asking ourselves and to our stakeholders nowadays is another apparently quite simple. And the question is, uh, what's your power? To ask what's your power means, uh, what is your talent? What is your knowledge? What is your expertise? What you can share with all of us in order to better the world? So what does it mean? Simply is the ecosystem approach we really want to deploy all over. This, that's it. It's a journey. We are on the path, hopefully on the right one, but we are really passionate and we love it. And so we really would like to share with you all also this opportunity because it's a land of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Cristina. Uh, now I want to welcome to the stage Helen Steele. Helen Steele is the executive director of the Shared Value Project, which uh, approximates what the Shared Value Initiative does globally, but in uh, Australia. And um, Helen has been leading this. Come on up, Helen. Helen has been leading this since, uh, since the inception. It was started with uh, the chairman, Peter Yates, who's sitting up front here and is a great example of how we try to partner and work with others to advance shared value in their geographies. So please join me in welcoming Helen. Thanks so much, Justin. And just to let you know, I have actually had a promotion. Um, I am now the CEO of the Shared Value Project, so um, just, just, just update your, your, your... Thank you, thank you. So um, Justin has given me six minutes to sort of share with you some of our journey, um, a, a very short period of time. I did think that perhaps some sort of interpretive dance routine might be exciting for this group first thing in the morning. But I, uh, sadly, I wasn't able to get my act together and, and Murray, Christina and I were thinking of, you know, working on this actually quite actively in Australia recently, but couldn't get it together. So he here I am. Um, so we, we began our journey uh, in, in 2011, shortly after reading the, um, the original article, my uh, colleague and co-founder of the Shared Value Project, Rod Ellis Jones, brought this article to me. And look, I guess it really captured um, my imagination. I had not long returned from quite an extensive period here in the US working in the CSR world. And what I was experiencing in Australia upon my return was, was vastly different than the mature CSR conversation we were having here in the US. So when we read the article, we thought, well, this is a relatively simple idea, as of course all you know now, it, it's a very complex uh, conversation. But we discard, started that uh, informal dialogue back in 2011 and created what has now become uh, the Shared Value Project. So one of the things that became apparent to us in, in those early days was that leadership was going to be vital to this, to this conversation. Um, and, uh, and so I invited uh, Peter Yates, who's now our chair, um, to participate in some informal dialogues. And I say invite, but really it was cajoling, persuading, persuading him that this idea had some merit and giving him some confidence that we invited some of his, his, leader, his colleagues 
um, that we could have a robust discussion. Fortunately, Peter did um, did accept the challenge, and we started with some. We started that very first dialogue. I was reflecting today. We had BHP in the room. We had National Australia Bank. We had PwC, AIA Australia. We had some very powerful organisations. Um, and what began is, is an informal discussion, but we realised that you know there was something here. Um, and as I recalled, uh, uh, I, we first came to the attention of FSG not long after that, when we, Rod and I, bought up every domain name that we possibly could around shared value, and we had the idea that we could trademark the concept. Um, as it turned out, we could not. But FSG got on the phone to us and said, hey, what are you Australians doing down there? Um, what's going on? Do you want to have a discussion? Um, so what actually began there was what has ultimately become uh, an important relationship with us as we embarked on sort of de developing towards becoming the first regional partner of the Shared Value Initiative. Um, by the way, if anyone in Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia or Singapore is thinking about starting up Shared Value Project, I've got the domain name for you and we'll sell it to you at a very good rate. So, as our journey um, progressed, the, the FSG announced their first affiliate consulting training. Hands up if any of you went to that. I went along to that with my colleague Rod Ellis-Jones. Anyone else attend that first session back in 2013? No, wow. Um, so we kind of spent three days in Boston trying to work out what on earth this concept shared value was. It was a very robust discussion. A lot of us had difficulty getting beyond the CSR conversation. Um, so I kind of came away from that, possibly not having much more clarity around the idea of shared value. But what was very clear to me was that there was this sense of excitement and the beginnings of what has now become a global community. I also remember quite vividly the last slide that they showed as part of that session, which said sharedvalue.org. Well, we bought the domain name sharedvalue.org.au, so it seemed natural that we would be having or starting a conversation about creating a partnership, which we ultimately have. So, what's going on in Australia? I mean, I think it's fair to say, and I've got Michael and Mark um, um, to my right, that when they created or wrote this article, they weren't thinking about Australia, a, a very developed country. They were thinking about emerging markets. Um, so the fact that it's very much captured the imagination of the corporate sector in Australia, I think is somewhat surprising to everyone, perhaps even a little bit amusing. But I think what it goes to say is that no matter how a, a country or, or a region is developed, um, everybody f faces social issues, many of us the same social issues. And, and I think interestingly in Australia, because we're geographically surrounded by many emerging markets, I mean, the conversation now naturally has evolved for us to have that regional discussion and be thinking beyond just what can happen in Australia. Although, um, for those of you who don't know, Mark Kramer also sits on our board of directors. And, and Mark, two years ago, um, seeded this idea that Australia could actually become a shared value nation. Now, um, to, to pose that idea to someone like me, who, who is obviously quite audacious, um, you know, it, it really has got us thinking about what would a shared, shared value nation look like and how could we actually drive that and realise that possibility. So we held our conference, uh, our summit, in Australia two weeks ago. We do need to have a better conversation, Justin, about scheduling the timing so it's not quite so chaotic for all of us. But look, that conversation for us was certainly the most mature discussion we'd had. It was very much going back to a corporate discussion. Um, and what was re we were, it was remarkable, the, the calibre of speakers we had, the number of, um, we mentioned boards just earlier, the number of chairs from Australia's top listed companies who actually spoke at the conference and the number of CEOs. And that was also reflected in the, in the, delegate, in the delegates who were there. But I think rather than me um, continue to better illustrate the sense of excitement that we've generated in Australia, I'd like to show you this brief video.
the journey is happening in Australia. And it really creates a vision for me that I've never thought of before, of what does a shared value nation look like? And I think that Australia has the potential to become the world's leading shared value nation. In the past 12 months, the Shared Value Project has continued to help shape the agenda for a community of leaders and practitioners in Australia and the Asia-Pacific region. We have hosted uh, 47 events, including three annual forums, a government forum, networking events, panel discussions and leadership dialogue in Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong and New York. We've had more than 3,000 people attending those events. We've produced 10 case studies and research articles. We've garnered more than 90 media spots, including print, online television and radio. And the shared value community in Australia and the Asia Pacific continues to grow with more than 25 members representing corporate, government and community organisations. It's also maturing with several Australian based companies including IAG, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, Nestle and NAB featuring on the global fortune Change the World list. Making shared value a hot topic in boardrooms and C-suites around the country and with more than 80% of people believing CEOs and companies should take the lead in shaping how social issues are solved, shared value has an even bigger role to play. We have got something um, which is an idea uh, which is a movement uh, which is uh, very rich and very exciting. The community is also recognising leadership in shared value and celebrating the world leading examples being delivered across the Asia Pacific region through the annual Shared Value Awards program. As a result, business leaders including the 2017 Shared Value Champion Dr Ken Henry are advocating for shared value in forums across the country and around the world telling Australian company directors that one of the more important things we in business can do at this time is accept responsibility for the social and environmental outcomes of our activities. And to support the next generation, Australia has launched its first university program focused on shared value. It's tremendously exciting that we're going to have an MBA course that actually teaches the tenets of shared value and allows those smart, ambitious young Australians to apply that in their work practice. With new tools to help practitioners, a strong knowledge exchange between members of the shared value community and regular examples of businesses gaining competitive advantage while solving social issues, Australia is well on its way to becoming the shared value nation. It's so wonderful to see the evolution and that what we really heard about today are powerful business initiatives that really do create shared value. Thank you, Helen and Maria Christina. Good morning. I'm Mark Kramer, the co-author with Michael Porter of the Creating Shared Value article and a co-founder with Michael of FSG. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 8th Annual Shared Value Summit. Uh, I have just a couple thoughts uh, to share before um, I invite Michael up uh, to kick us off. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask uh, Justin Backley to come back up. As some of you know, uh, this is Justin's last Shared Value Summit. He has decided to move on in June to the next adventure in life. And I just wanted to say a few words because ideas are important, but they're just ideas. It is really uh, people that animate them, that make them happen. Justin has built a great team at the Shared Value Initiative, but he really has become the global ambassador for Shared Value that has spread awareness an understanding of this concept all over the world. And um, it really is our tremendous privilege that Justin has led this effort these years. We have immense gratitude. None of us would be here without Justin. So please join me in thanking him for his years of service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to share a, a quick thought. You know, we often say that we disagree with Milton Friedman, who said the business of business is profit. 
And we do disagree in the sense that he meant business shouldn't think about social or environmental consequences that are externalities. But in another sense, you know, creating shared value is about competitive advantage. And competitive advantage is about achieving superior profitability. And so in that sense, we don't really disagree. But I was thinking, I think our disagreement actually goes back much further to a different business leader. 130 years ago, Andrew Carnegie, in the Gospel of Wealth, also said that business, that it would be wrong for business to think about the welfare of society as part of its business strategy. He said, if I pay my employees more, we'll go out of business. Our competitors will win. The right thing to do is to run your business as a rigorous business. And then when you've made money, become a philanthropist and give it away. And that's the noble thing to do. And I believe that really was the origin of this great divide that has so many of us in the world believing that either you're here to make money or you're here to do good. And that those two don't go together. And of course, that's what we've come to see as being wrong, as being a false choice, as being a choice that has really blinded us to immense opportunity, both to do more good and to create greater profit. There are many movements today that are trying to redefine the role of business in society. What distinguishes the concept of creating shared value, I believe, is that it doesn't just tell you what you ought to do, but it begins to tell you how to do it. That together with Professor Porter, we really are building out a curriculum in business schools, in settings like this, in other conferences, to try and teach people how to think differently about the strategic decisions they face to recognize the interdependence between business and society. And that's really the core of why we're here today. So it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Michael Porter. If you are lucky enough to have been a student of Michael's or a colleague of Michael's or a friend of Michael's, you will have come to recognize that Michael sees truths that others miss. And to that insight, he adds unflagging enthusiasm and a commitment to real intellectual rigor. There's no real way to enumerate the number of articles and books that Michael has written, the influence that he's had on global leaders, both in business and in government around the world. If you really want to save space on your library, you should only get the HBR issues that don't have a copy, uh, have an article by Michael in them. But then, of course, why would you want those issues? Anyway, it is, uh, if anyone has really created shared value through his life's work, it is my friend and colleague, Michael Porter. My gosh, that was much too generous. Um, but um, it keeps me going, Mark. Uh, a lot of work to be done. Well, first of all, I want to just add my thanks and congratulations to Justin. Um, remarkable partner and colleague in this, uh, what some thought at some points was a crazy idea and a crazy quest uh, that we've been involved in and that brings all, all of us here together. And um, uh, Justin ha has had a great mix of, in terms of intellect and style and drive to kind of make this happen, get this group together, uh, and lead to countless other things that have happened around the world. He, he touches virtually everything that's, that this organization and this movement has done, and uh, couldn't be more grateful to you, Justin. Uh, uh, without, without you, uh, we wouldn't be here, as Mark said. Um, what I wanted to, uh, uh, first, I also want to just say, it, it's exhilarating to see all of you here in this room. 
and um, and to I know a lot of you now, uh, but I, there's, new, there's new people here. There, there are people here that I've known for a long time that are finally here, uh, that now think it's okay to be here. Uh, but uh, uh, I see some, I see people in this room that have led, like the Australia effort, uh, tremendous efforts in other parts of the world. I see Amit Kapoor from India, uh, who's a, a kind of a force of nature of his own. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's just exhilarating. What a wonderful day. This is the best day of the year uh, to be able to stand here and, and see all of you here. It's also, uh, I think, a, quite an interesting moment in what we're doing together. Um, you know, it's a little bit uh, risky to use this phrase, but actually I think this is an inflection point of huge significance that we're involved in right now, in this period. Not in 2011, where this article was published, but now, uh, seven years later. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, I think, the, the evolution of this movement um, and where it fits. Mark has stolen a little bit of my thunder, bad boy. Uh, but uh, I, let me, I'll add a little bit more uh, to, to the uh, granularity of, of uh, that, that uh, evolution. And I think it's really quite important for us to see uh, where we are now. And uh, I know there are people in this room that are not all the way there with shared value. We're, we, we kind of, in this, in this general field of, of how does society, what should society, uh, business do in society, what should business's role be, be in society, I've got to tell you, there's still a lot of confusion. There's still, still a lot of people that talk about, oh, of course. There's still a lot of agreement but not agreement. Uh, when, when one gets to the really rubber meets the road in terms of what does this really mean? And what do we really need to do? And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, that process, that journey, how we've gotten to this place uh, and, um, and where we, I think, are today and I think uh, where, we're, where we're going. Um, these are, these are thoughts in my mind that form very quickly. Literally yesterday, something like epic happened in our movement. That some of you may, yeah, I'm sure most of you didn't even see it. Uh, but uh, but th these things are starting to happen. And I think this gives me great hope and great optimism that we, we are off to the races. That business is going to change forever. The way we think about capitalism is changing forever. Uh, finally, after a long, long, uh, complicated process of getting us there. So um, I think the, the early, uh, you know, most of you are very familiar with this slide. If you've been here before, you've seen, you've seen, you've seen it before. Uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, we, some time ago, when we got over the denial phase, that business should just, you know, go do its business and ignore everything else. And uh, we actually started thinking, well, business should give some money. Philanthropy uh, was, a, was a big movement in this field. We forget how big it was uh, for many years. And then we started this pivot to this notion of corporate social responsibility that uh, there was more to do than just give money and volunteer. Uh, that might even be even more important. But the social responsibility movement, as we all know, was really important, and we're not done, and it doesn't, it's not over. <laughs> but it's fundamentally not, it, but it's fundamentally about mitigating risk and reducing harm. Um, and that was important, and that was a breakthrough, and we've gotten much better at it, and Every company does it, and hopefully will forever. It's part of business practice now. If you don't, if you don't figure out that you ought to do this stuff, then you know where have you been? Uh, you're at risk. 
Um, but, and, 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 and in, in the face of this uh, corporate responsibility movement, our little band of people and, I, and, and thought leaders that were thinking about shared value um, started to arise uh, six or seven years ago. And um, as, as kind of a next step. And a foundation has been built of what that next step looks like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but, but hopefully if I called any of you up to the, to the podium now, you could explain it, what the next step is, the shared value step. That said, it's been frustratingly slow to move people to that next step. Even though everybody agrees with sort of the basic idea that business has to have an impact on society. Uh, but there's been a tremendous uh, sort of confusion and, and lack of clarity on what that actually means. What's impact? What does that look like? How do we think about that? Um, there's been a lot of agreement on this general broad issue, but actually not so much agreement on the real focused hard details of how you would actually do it and what doing it really means and what qualifies as having real uh, impact. Um, it's been uh, hard to get that agreement. We've tried. I've been in, you know, I talk to, I, I've trained CEOs, you know, every year. I trained probably another 25 CEOs at Harvard and we're out there all the time. We're talking about this with lots of organizations and Everybody agrees we have to worry more about social impact, and everybody agrees we have to, you know, business has to have a, be a bigger force. But in terms of what that means, what that looks like, wow, it, it's, it's like, it's like, uh, it's squishy. You know, you can talk and you can get aligned, but then it turns out you're not really aligned when you raise a certain issue. Oh no, that's not, I'm not saying that. We've kind of been in this process for the last several years. And uh, I think as a result, uh, we've got tremendous progress in this group. If you look at the Shared Value uh, Initiative, there's wow, probably thousands of examples now. There's this movement around the world that you've heard about. Um, uh, uh, so, so in a way, we, we, there, things have been happening. But it's been challenging. Um, uh, now, part of the issue has to do with what's been happening in the investor community. And I think over the years we've come to see the investor community as part of the big problem. That they aren't buying in. The business would kind of like to buy in, but the investor community hasn't wanted to buy in. I indeed, the investor community has kind of tracked this evolution process that we've been on. Again, remember, the investor community started in denial. No, not social impact. No. That's not what we do. We're fiduciaries. And the assumption was that social impact reduces profitability, and therefore, that's not for us. And it started with Milton Friedman. Uh, over time, though, we've started to see the investment community start to adapt to tremendous demand on the part of investors to do something here with their capital, to use their capital uh, in, in, in a more positive way. And, you know, ethical investing was really the early, the early movement there, you know, uh, not, uh, not investing in bad companies. It was not investing in good companies, it was not investing in bad companies. Screens. That was where the investor community started. And over time now, we've built a gigantic kind of sustainability investing or social responsibility investing movement billions, trillions of dollars uh, placed in that. But what that evolved, turned out to be was mostly, uh, you know, kind of ranking companies on br a broad set of indicators, uh, which are normally talked about in terms of ESG indicators. Environment, social governance uh, type indicators, and companies were sort of assessed, are you good or bad, or 
uh, you know, on, on these many indicators and rankings were created and that and, and the capital was put into uh, portfolios of higher ranking companies along these broad environmental and social indicators. Those were generic indicators. This wasn't about companies and their business. This was about indicators that were just good things from a you know, social impact point of view or avoiding bad things. And that's where the investor community had gotten, except for some, you know, some early pioneers that went beyond this. You know, Generation, uh, DBL, uh, you'll all know others. Organizations, you know, the impact investing movement kind of was a little sprout, you know, going off uh, in the investment community uh, to start to think about, well, no, actually, I, th I think there's something much more powerful here. I think it's really about business. I think it's about strategy. Let's find companies that know how to do this. They will win. But though, that was a small fraction of the overall investor effort. And it's that, uh, that, that concern. We use, at this meeting every year, we always complain about investors. Okay, that's one of our big problems that we have. Oh, investors, they don't get it. We try to present this in our, you know, earnings reports and they, you know, fall asleep or they sign off the, the call and, you know, they don't get this. They don't want to play. Okay. Well, you know, this is 2018 and the shot heard round the world has been fired. And it starts with this one. This is the largest investor in the world, or at least I, I think it's in the world. It's certainly in America. This <laughs> investor owns every piece of every company, virtually, in the economy. And this uh, investor says, society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. Okay, fine. The real question is what a social purpose means <laughs> and how companies should serve a social purpose. Uh, to prosper over time, to prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but not only deliver financial performance, but show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Financial performance and positive contribution to society are not inconsistent. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with Larry Fink over the years, and wow. Every single CEO that they own, a uh, the company, a piece of the company, got this letter, and about 20 of them call me, the CEOs. Holy, I would use the right word, but I'm not. Holy <laughs> moly. <laughs> what is this? What, what just happened? And I, I can tell you that if you go to Vanguard or IA Craft, which you'll hear from Roger uh, Ferguson here, uh, they, they're not quite there yet. They're not, they haven't got, written their letter yet, but my hunch is they will. They'll write this letter too. And between the three of them, they own almost everything. <laughs> not, not really, but they own a big, huge chunk of, of the enterprises. But what really got me going, and, and is why I'm giving this somewhat bizarre talk today, as opposed to my more typical talk, is what happened yesterday. Several high profile activists, blah, 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 see environmental and social factors as profit play. Wall Street activist investors once known for pushing for extreme cost cutting or just about anything that would boost the bottom line are starting to use their money to promote a different kind of corporate action, social and environmental change. They are doing this, they say, not only as a matter of moral responsibility, but for their original mission of generating better returns for their clients. This happened. Yesterday, and uh, you know, I I I, I know pe other people like this. The problem isn't investors anymore. The problem is us. We have to, 
as business leaders, we have to rise to this challenge. We have to deliver on what I think now uh, the investment community and the leaders in that community are starting to understand. And the question is now increasingly, how do we do that? How do we get business aligned on what to do? How do we get clarity on what shared value really is? It's been really hard to get clarity because we have a whole array of stuff out there and language and words and concepts and pet ideas that have been flowing out for decades. And a lot of those ideas were, were kind of prescient and innovative. But unfortunately, what they did was they didn't actually provide the clarity and the, the playbook for how to do this. Uh, you recognize all these concepts. You know, it's the circular economy, you know. Well, that's kind of kind of like shared value, right? But actually, when you start thinking about it rigorously, it, it's really not about strategy. It's not about you know competitive advantage. You know, it's 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 a more general idea around the around the economy. Green capitalism, net positive. There's something a little closer to shared value, net positive. That means the positive outweighs the cost. Um, uh, if, as we think about social impact, uh, the, a huge part of the space here has been focused on the environment. But environment is just one part of social uh, performance. There's a lot of other dimensions. And what we, have, what we need to do is move beyond a view where it's the environment. That's it. There's a lot more that matters out there than just the environment. Okay? And, but yet many of the, the movements here have really been focused on that one area. Uh, now I'm not a, against working on that area. Of course not. I've written extensively in that area. But, but we, we, it's more than that. And then there's been a lot of discussion about making capitalism better. And again, I just put down a few of the, the phrases that you may have heard. And each of these has organizations and movements and seminars and sessions and meetings like this. But what you find when you look into these is it's not really clear what it means you should do and how that leads to profit. So we have a lot of people in this movement, they sort of agree at a high level, but operationally, there's been lack of clarity. You know, just something you know, earlier, and that the, the closer you can get this social stuff to business strategy, the more likely you're actually talking sense. And not just values and ethics and things like that. So, of course, this group of people has been really trying, but it's been hard. <coughs> and, uh, and partly because of the, of the movement that's evolved and all the various shoots of ideas that have been uh, put out there. And then there's some things that get fairly close to shared value, uh, like triple bottom line. I mean, in a way, that was a very, very prescient early uh, concept, you know, people, planet, profit. And there's something pretty darn close to shared value in there, but yet the playbook wasn't there. Okay, so how do you do that? And so without the clarity, lots of people could do lots of different things. Some of them actually were CSR. <laughs> Pretty much, a lot of them were really CSR type stuff. They really were tied connecting with the business, uh, directly to the business. And so we've had this period of years and years where there's a lot of stuff floating around out there. 
And a lot of people are nodding their heads, and we're all kind of getting to the point where we agree with the broad idea that, yes, business has to engage in society and social issues. The question then of how has been a struggle. Not, of course, among our movement here. We sort of have tried to, that a central focus of the Street Value uh, uh, Initiative has been to kind of create that clarity on what do you actually do. Uh, but, but again, there's been, a, there's been a lot of back and forth and to and fro, and as a result, the progress in many companies has been relatively slow. It's really too bad how many companies today basically still are doing CSR. That's what they're still doing. They haven't gone beyond that. And that's because they couldn't get their, they, their board is uncomfortable, or they, they, there's all kinds of reasons. The central idea that we have sort of been working on together for the last seven or eight years, uh, post article, is a next phase that is, is, is exquisitely clear. And that next phase says, we have, if we think about making social change and, 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 and improving, uh, addressing social issues, and we want to take this to the next level, we have to do it through the business with a business model. And a business model means that we have to make the dreaded word profit. Profit is essential to any real progress in changing society through business. If there's no profit, you lose what I like to call the magic of capitalism. If there's profit, you, ha you can self-sustain. You don't have to decide how much money to give this year. You give as much as you can, as long as you can deploy it with a profit. And it's scalable, OK? Uh, the, the concept of shared value puts social impact in a different zone than all those movements that I showed you earlier. Those are more aspirational. They're more about what would be good. This is actually about business. It's just business. We have to learn uh, about you know, making social and community and that broad range of impacts that matter for society. We have to start thinking about those only as just business. We can't think about them with our heart. We can't think about them with our ethics. We can't think about them with you know, PR in, in mind. We have to just learn to think about, we can do all those things on the side, it feels good. But at the core, we have to think about these as business. That is the huge gap that we, that we haven't been able to cross, or gulf, I should say, uh, in, this, in this issue uh, on a global basis. But I think the world is ready for this. Think we're ready. And hopefully, if, I think you'll, hopefully your company is ready. And we can stop having those kind of confusing discussions about what we're going to do and how to think about it. Uh, and, you know, uh, is this really business or not? Or is this something else in some other bucket? Now, what you all have... I think all should be aware of, because we talk a lot about this here in this meeting, and many of you have been, been here before in, in the articles, is um, this opportunity to improve business results through tapping into social change um, is uh, inherently everywhere. Um, and the biggest problem we had in this entire field was that we started out thinking that this opportunity wasn't there. We started out thinking that doing social things would reduce business results. That cleaning up our, you know, 
plants so they didn't dump into the river would raise our cost. Uh, that trying to have better worker safety would be more expensive. We, we, start, we were debilitated by this trade-off mentality, and so many people still, even today, have this. That when we think about a social issue, just be, if you're going to try to do something good about that social issue, beware, because that's going to be costly and that's going to create a trade-off. We were poisoned by the concept of externalities. The concept of the externality says that when a company pollutes, for example, uh, it inflicts costs on society but doesn't bear any of those costs itself. But what we've come to understand is that's wrong. When a company pollutes, it inflicts cost on itself. <laughs> it's wasting resources. It's, it's using inefficient processes. And over and over again, if we reduce environmental impact in almost every possible dimension, we learn over and over and over again we're, we're more efficient, we're more productive. Our costs go down. Our profits go up. So we, we, this group, hopefully, sitting in this room, we've understood that we can't be fooled by the history. And by the way, a lot of this history was created by my colleagues. Now, I'm a dreaded PhD in economics. And it was economics that invented this view of the world, which, which I think now is radically changing, rapidly changing. And now economists are some of the leaders in figuring out how to do effective social change, but, but, but this we had to overcome. I'm, I'm trying to help all of us understand why has this been as big a struggle as it's been? And, and the answer is because of, of the, the context and the history and where we're coming from and what people's beliefs were. What we're learning from the shared value movement is over and over and over again, we're learning that we can actually use conventional markets to deal with a lot of market failures or social problems rather than have to use market failure thinking, government, NGOs, donations, and so forth. We can't solve all our problems uh, through markets. We know that. We know there's some areas we just have to either give give money or have government take over or have an NGO take over. Uh, but boy, uh, we can serve a lot of, pro of, of needs and, and social problems with markets. And it's our job in business to figure out how to deal with those problems. So whatever issue it is, you know, uh, you know early childhood diseases or whatever that issue is, the first place we had to look is, could we find a way to make a market work here? And um, again, there's still a suspicion of markets among folks that are not you know, working in companies. Even people working in companies sometimes are suspicious of markets. And so you can see why it's been a long journey to get, to get us here. But if activist investors have figured this out, it's time. It's time. It's time to take the leap. Shared value, as Justin said, is not about doing good. <laughs> it's strategy. Good old business strategy. It's an opportunity to differentiate ourselves in meeting needs better of customers, and markets we want to serve, it's an opportunity to reduce our cost and do things more efficiently. Shared value is not about all this other stuff. It's actually about strategy. And the more clearly we can see it that way, the more progress we'll make. Uh, but it's been hard to shed the other baggage that comes from this long history of business under attack for not being supportive and helpful and therefore we want to bolster our reputation and, 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 and do things to make us look you know, good, like good people. And, and, and we're, 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 we have to shed all that history and just view this as business strategy. 
Uh, we all understand the key concept of business strategy and uh, you know, when we teach shared value now at HBS, the first day we talk about strategy. That's where we have to hook this work. Um, and, you know, strategy is about how do we differentiate ourselves? We differentiate ourselves when we can produce a better, a better and more unique product. And the so social dimensions of our products and, and environmental dimensions of our products are very much part of the needs that customers want. And they become a critical way of differentiating ourselves. And we create competitive advantage if we can lower our cost. And what we're learning over and over again is the way we have been doing things is ridiculously costly compared to better ways of doing it that reflect the kind of uh, societal and social needs uh, uh, that, that we have often not recognized as critical to how we do business. Um, we, we have found that we can transform how we do everything in the company. Virtually every dimension of the value chain is now being reinvented by shared value thinking. How we purchase, how we run our supply chain, how we run our trucks, how we do, how we do marketing, how we do sales, how we do after-sales service, how we deal with our employees, how we deal with employee health issues, how we create skills, everything. Is the curriculum of, uh, of business schools is being rewritten. That was not something that every professor raised their hand and said, oh yeah, let's rewrite our curriculum. It took a long time to get over that bar of that, that sort of view. No, 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 we kind of know how to do supply chain management. Well, guess what? We don't. Because we never considered this and this and this and this, which are the kind of the, the things that, from a silo point of view, we, we really care about. Shared value is about creating unique value propositions in our business. Shared value is about creating distinctive ways of operating, delivering our products better, purchasing better making better, distributing better, marketing better. Uh, shared value is about uh, the ability to uh, you know, distinguish ourselves more clearly through making clear trade-offs about who we, what we want to do versus what our competitors want to do. You all know this stuff. Uh, you know, this is a strategy example that I'd love to talk about, but I don't have time. <laughs> but at the core, what we're talking about here, at a very meta level, what shared value offers us is the opportunity to actually shift the nature of competition that we see in virtually every industry. You know, in most industries, we kind of fell into a pattern of here's how you compete. You know, you, you, you know, you're always improving your features and your functionality of the product in more conventional ways. You're, you're finding ways to be more efficient and, you know, take out unnecessary cost. And there was kind of a rhythm of how you competed in food or competed in mining or competed in almost any other industry. What your value has done is it's opened up a floodgate of opportunities to do it differently. And we're going to hear about those kind of companies throughout this, th this meeting. And we like to think of that as a lot of historical competition in industries was more zero sum. We kind of sort of copied each other and tried to do it a little bit better. Shared value opens up the opportunity to do it differently. And therefore, you have companies that can serve different kinds of needs in different ways. And, and, and hopefully, the value for society goes up. So we, we, we've, 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 we've opened up, I think, an opportunity to truly shift the trajectory of what uh, capitalism actually looks like and what competition actually uh, 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 comes out of that. Shared value is an enormous opener of opportunity for new strategies. 
new needs to meet, new ways of getting to the market, new ways of making and delivering our products, and so on, and so on, and so on. We all know the basic framework. Shared value has a playbook. It says these opportunities come in three broad buckets. How we rethink our products and our customers, how we uh, rethink how we operate our value chains, and how we think more broadly, not just about what's happening inside the company, but what's happening in the business environment in which we're drawing in the company to do what we do. Okay, we've, we've talked about this many times. This is, everybody here should kind of be able to recite this stuff in their sleep. But if you, if you the, the wonderful thing about this is we have a playbook. We know how to start looking. It's hard to do it. It takes innovation and so forth, but we have that playbook. And, uh, uh, and we have to learn how to do it better and better. And we have to keep raising the bar of intellectual uh, expertise about, about how to do this. We've got great examples, you know, Discovery Health, uh, we, uh, that, are, that you just can't debate whether they're successful or not. Uh, you know, you'll hear about Walmart. I, I won't let you look at this too long because, you know, Kathleen McLaughlin, they're transforming the entire company with shared value. This is the largest company in the world. This company was kind of the Darth Vader of companies. <laughs> this company was about everything bad. And this company is changing the definition of how they compete in very salient ways, driven by shared value. This, this is the kind of the key or the golden ticket that unlocked this new way of being Walmart. And uh, we'll talk more over over time about the notion of the business ecosystem, we're learning that to do shared value, you, need to, you often need to reach even a little bit farther outside of your traditional business partners and stakeholders to actually get this done. The shared value movement, I think, and you'll hear more over the coming uh, day, is, is, uh, uh, is really uh, starting to get traction. Uh, there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, curriculum now being developed. We have courses spreading around many business schools. Years ago, we said we have to rewrite the business school curriculum, and most of the people in the audience probably said, "Yeah, right." Okay, it's happening. Uh, there's conferences and workshops around the world. There's lots of scholarly literature. Um, there's the country initiatives you've heard about. There's the prizes uh, for shared value around the world you've you've heard about. There's the change the world list that has been an extraordinary catalyst for um, you know, starting to make this a serious uh, sort of uh, e externally refereed process of thinking about this, but we're just beginning. Th this is an inflection point. I, I, sometimes I'm wrong, you know, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so about this. I know, I know so many people in business around the world, and I just have this feeling that the pieces have come together. So I hope all of you, first of all, will feel extremely excited about the opportunity now that has presented itself. The obstacles are falling away. Uh, the, our opportunity, uh, to take leadership and to be innovators is growing substantially. Uh, what an exciting time to be working with this perspective on this agenda, you know, in this way. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, I feel much more optimism <laughs> about the ability of our beleaguered planet to cope with all those huge numbers of problems we have than I have in a long, long time. So uh, uh, I know I'm over time, Justin. Justin's going to, he's standing there. 
but uh, this is just such a phenomenal moment after a long history of working in this field that I, I think all of us, we should all share this feeling that let's, we're just beginning. Let's get this done, let's step it up, let's move it faster. And I think you're gonna learn a lot about how to do that over the coming meeting. So Justin, I will now officially stop. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so for you your kind words. Yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Michael. Michael. Thank you, Michael. And uh, now I have his cell phone, so I can tell you <laughs> what messages are coming in uh, from his talk. Uh, Mike will be back in conversation with the CEO of Humana, Bruce Broussard, in a little while. But thank you for your opening and inspiring conversations. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our opening panel of the day. Um, as Michael touched on, uh, and when he was talking about this big news from yesterday, I must confess, probably like a lot of you, I was thinking, uh-oh, what, what big news? Shouldn't I have known about the big news? But thank you for, um, for bringing that to our attention. Um, and our first panel, in fact, uh, focuses on continuing this investor dialogue. Uh, and we're going to be joined um, by Managing Director from Focusing Capital on the Long Term, which is a relatively new organization launched by BlackRock and McKinsey and others to put together research and a change agenda in the investor space. And we'll be joined by Bhakti Merchandani, who's a Managing Director from that organization. And she will be in conversation with Vishal Vasheth, who's the co-founder and managing director of Obvious Ventures, which is a venture capital firm that's focused on making investments to, uh, in companies that, are, uh, that have a social and environmental purpose. And he is also, cool job, the former chief strategy officer of Patagonia. And then we're also joined by Alessandro Benetton, who is the former chairman of the Benetton Group in Italy. And also for the last 20 years, he's been the uh, founder and managing partner of 21 Partners which is a private equity firm uh, in Europe that sees shared value as a mechanism for driving um, and building value in portfolio companies uh, that they invest in in Europe. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Bhakti, Vishal, and Alessandro. about the benefits of strategic engagement between investors and companies. Strategic engagement is the interaction between investors and companies about issues critical to generating long-term value. These strategic issues include business strategy, competing demands for capital allocation, the hiring, firing, and compensation of the management team, risk management, and most importantly for today, creating value by solving social problems or shared value. Across a shared value field, companies are focused on how to build investor support for implementing purpose-driven strategies over the long term. Investors, even as Michael Porter just mentioned, high-profile activists like Blue Harbor and JANA Partners naturally understand the benefits of incorporating social and environmental factors into investment decisions. At the same time, there are pressures to cut costs and increase efficiencies, often at the expense of innovation and growth by solving social problems. In the private equity and venture capital spaces, investors have more flexibility and inclination to invest over the long term and can rise above the da daily pressures of stock prices and quarterly earnings. In this context, shared value can become an approach to long-term value creation. This will be our focus over the next 30 minutes we're excited for a, uh, a, a rich discussion with two trailblazers, Alessandro Benetton of 21 Investimenti and Vishal Vashist of Obvious Ventures. You have their illustrious backgrounds in the speaker bios, and since our time together is, is limited, we'll dive right into a substantive moderated session, which as Mark Kramer noted in his uh, welcoming remarks, will include both what you ought to do and how to do it. And after the moderated session, we'll be taking questions. So please 
submit and vote on questions at any time. So we'll, let's kick off with the impetus behind founding each of, of your firms. Get started first. Okay. Well, I break the ice. Well, uh, morning to everybody. And, uh, you know, I actually uh, have to start uh, by using the help of Mark Kramer, you know, who said, uh, you know, anybody who had the privilege of being a Michael Porter student, I, I was one of those guys. And, and, and I'm particularly proud and happy to be here today because I can actually, you know, testify which, which type of influence all of this had on my career and, and, and my life. You know, I'm sure many of you are asking, you know, why, why is that guy talking about private equity when he comes from a large family with a very well-known activity in the textile business, which I actually led for a very short period of time, and he's talking about something different. Well, the story is very simple, you know. Uh, I did my field study with Professor Porter. Field study is some sort of thesis that you do at the end of the second year at HBS. And at that time, my family had diversified into the sports and good industries. So, you know, we had the textile business, which, again, if I look generationally, most of us do know about it. And uh, I decided to diversify into a new sector, which was the sports and good industry. So that some sports and good industry companies had been acquired. And uh, so I was supposed to join that. I have a passion for sports. Uh, I had a passion uh, for, you know, you know, industrial uh, and, and, uh, and issues about companies. And uh, I proposed this to Professor Porter, and he said, yes, you know, let's study all of this together. And, and we actually did. And, you know, what, what really what was very much of an influence on me was his ability. You know, we, we, talk about, we, we, we did talk about competitive strategy. You know, the fact that he, a competitive advantage, that the first thing that uh, we came to conclude, to conclude was that uh, uh, that industry that was a profitable industry was going to change uh, in a dramatic way because uh, large distribution was going to come into the picture. So basically, to make a long story short, I went back home and I said, okay, that's what we think should be done. That's what is, is the path and that's what is needed. Today you are competitive, but if you want to be competitive for the next 20 years, you need to change. You know, so what, what has made you successful at it today is not one is going to make you successful in the future. Um, unfortunately, you know, I did not find a very fertile ground with, with uh, investors, with uh, shareholders, and uh, with the management. Uh, the basic answer was, oh, stop. You know, we got the Benetton clothing business model, very successful. We're just going to apply the same business model there, uh, which actually was a little bit the opposite of what uh, we were proposing. Uh, so it's, it's quite simple, you know, you are 26, 26 years old, you know, everybody looks at you and, and sees you, okay, this guy is so smart, you know, he went to Harvard Business School and he's trying to explain us what to do. And we have been successful for 30 years. And, and, uh, and, and so I, I felt very timid and of course, you know, I, I, you kind of look in the mirror and says, it's quite obvious that people see that, you know, you, you're just dreaming or just they have big expectations but no real ground. On, uh, but, but, but still, I, I, I truly believe on that. So I basically decided to, to, to that, that was the moment to, to forge my own path and trying to adapt this theory of trying to anticipate you know, the changes and perhaps work on smaller companies so that would, have, that would have given me the opportunity, A, to understand better what a company is all about, you know, not getting into large companies. And secondly, this theory was actually right. So I started with uh, uh, some uh, friends and family fr money, you know, this uh, first small fund. And we started applying all these uh, rules of, and trying to anticipate what was going to happen. And, uh, and, you know, the fact that it was coming from a successful family with a very industrial orientation forced me to think in an industrial manner when I was making the investment. So I could not just say that I wanted to make money. I had to be, you know, a good guy as well. You know, I had to think about the local communities. I had to think about the workers because I had a reputation to defend. So I, I came in from that angle, you know. I wanted to have an industrial vision because I had to in order to defend, you know, the, the tradition I was coming from. And, uh, you know, soon I found out and, and, and this has been quantified, that 
that part of the job that we were doing that uh, to many original investors was not necessarily uh, it was not necessary to be to, 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 to be done and it, Professor Porter is absolutely right you know the first time we talked to investors about that they were oh we, we're not in that business let, let the people that do philanthropy do that you're not supposed to do that with our money. With our money, you're supposed to make money, period. And that's a different ball game. Um, but th then, e eventually, we were able to demonstrate that, uh, and today, I, I can say that 60% of the actions that we take in any company in which we participate, just you know, to give you, you know, some sort of a ballpark, you know, we have been in, 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 the, in, in the field of investing in the private equity for more than 25 years, and we have uh, an average uh, IRR of 21% uh, over 25 years. So things have gone out in demonstrated being well. Uh, but, but, but never, never compromise uh, that sort of uh, vision, industrial vision, and uh, trying to be uh, s somebody who, who thinks long term. So the way we invest is like we think long term. Even if we have to sell the company, we behave like uh, we will uh, keep it forever. So. Um I think, is this working? Yeah. Um, so Obvious uh, has roots in, uh, in, if you were in Silicon Valley, uh, has roots in incubating uh, Twitter. Uh, that's where we got our start. Um, and, uh, and four and a half years ago, me, James, and Ev, uh, who are the three co-founders, uh, had a shared belief. The belief is that uh, purpose-driven businesses, which are solving big problems of our times, are going to outperform their peers. Because of this belief, we, we saw an opportunity and we ended up raising an institutional fund. Uh, we uh, are investing, uh, we raised our first fund, which was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, hundred twenty-three million dollar fund, which was the first fund. We raised our second fund, which was in 2016, uh, which was one ninety-one million dollars. Um, our focus is 80% is early stage investing, uh, series C, series A. 20% is growth investing. Um, and, and another belief which we have is that uh, technology is going to kind of reshape every industry. Uh, and technology is growing exponentially. Uh, and, and, and change which is going to happen uh, is, is uh, going to reimagine different sectors of our, our economy. Um, and, and around that whole idea, we have prioritized three investment themes around which we invest. Theme number one is sustainable systems, which is reimagining resource intensive industries. Uh, and we have three sub themes, uh, building mobility and resources. As an example, one of our investments is, is in, in, a, in a company which is building gem quality diamonds in a lab as a way to disrupt mining industry. These are two, three, four carat diamonds, which we are selling into the gem quality mar or gem markets. Uh, second area of our focus uh, is uh, healthy living where we invest in food, care, and life. Um, uh, as an example, one of our companies in care is reversing type 2 diabetes and creating a shared risk model as a way to earn money by improving health. Third area of our focus is uh, people power, where we uh, look at future of work, future of money, and future of learning. Uh, one of our investments uh, is uh, in future of money is, uh, is a company called LTSC, which is a long-term, which is creating a new stock exchange around this whole idea of long-termism, um, and and so that's what we do. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, from your perspective, what is the most what are the most effective tools for strategic engagement between private uh, companies and private investors? We'll kick off on this one with Vishal first. Yeah. So I think given we have Michael Porter on here, uh, so I have to kind of start with frameworks. Um, I think so. The framework uh, which I use uh, in uh, in uh, before investing and during management of uh, of our portfolio companies is, is what I call uh, five. The framework is five P's, uh, and the center of the bullseye is is purpose. Uh, so what we are looking for is companies which have audacious goals, audacious purpose, like to kind of solve big something big where people get excited to uh, to join that that uh, mission. Second is product. How do you build a 10x better product than what is available in the market? Uh, third uh, uh, is people. Ultimately, it's people who can make things happen 
Uh, and, and we like to back people who think about not only product and business, but also think about culture uh, as, uh, in, in the same way as they think about product. Fourth, uh, P, uh, fourth is planet. And thinking about how do we build a business which is a gift to the society. And then lastly, how do we do it in a profitable way? So when, when we invest, we have this discussion with, uh, with the entrepreneur uh, and we kind of figure out what is short term goals so that we stay in business and what's the long term goal of changing a market. And, and as we learn things, uh, we change our, our, our uh, kind of tactics, but the framework remains intact. So that's how we manage uh, our businesses. Uh, if I have to select one word, uh, I, I, would, I would talk about reputation. Uh, re reputation is fundamental in our business, I think, and uh, you know, the first element, and there are many dimensions, you know, and the, the first and more obvious one is uh, the return. You know, how much money, what is your IRR, IRR you know, how much money you make, you know. Uh, and and, and that, 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 that we have found is just the initial gate through which you have to go. Uh, over time, uh, I think, uh, and we have, con we have tried to contribute to, to the growing of this uh, culture. Uh, reputation, uh, even from the investor point of view, has come to have a further dimension. And the further dimension is, uh, you know, uh, how good is the company when you sell it? Or how much better it is uh, compared to what it was when you first acquired it? And that has many different dimensions. So, uh, and, and the dimension that becomes obvious to the investors is, you know, how many people, uh, you know, how many more people you have in the workforce, uh, you know, how much you have invested in R&D and in automation, uh, uh, what about the local community, what about the supplier, what about the clients. But we have found out that there is an even more important element for us, which is the reputation in the local community. Now, picture this. You're buying a company from an entrepreneur. And that entrepreneur, he knows that perhaps he needs a partner in order to further go to the next stage. But uh, he's going to continue to live in that community. So, I mean, the guy wants you to be successful. And he wants the company to be treated very well because uh, it's like sort of a baby for him. And, 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 and this element uh, ended up for us becoming a competitive advantage. Because uh, for the same amount of uh, money, people would eventually prefer us because they know that we do care about the company and therefore have an effect on local community. Great. You're both private market investors. And private market investors have the advantages of a longer time horizon and also uh, a larger stake in the company. So they have more influence. So what best practices from strategic engagement or the investor company dialogue from private markets would you recommend to your counterparts in publicly traded companies? What can they learn from, from private markets? We'll kick off with Alessandro first. Uh, well, you know, uh, long term, I, I think that thinking long term, I mean, we, we have seen it from previous slides and that's what we try to do and that's the way we behave. Actually, we have recently launched uh, a fund that is uh, is, is, is a much longer one because you actually need time. But even if you do not need time, you know, try to convince people that uh, you, you need to have a vision about what, what you're doing. And eventually that is going to pay off. Never trade, uh, you know, some short term, uh, apparently economical advantageous choices uh, for the long term strategy. Unfortunately, the rule of the games for the publicly listed companies are not very favorable in that respect because they tend to you know, put your rising into the next, uh, you know, quarter, uh, quarterly report. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, my recommendation is uh, to think long term and, uh, you know, have the courage to be admired as an intelligent investor in, in, in the long term from everybody, not just from your, your investors. Yeah, I think to me, the key is incentive structure. Um, if, if the management is incentivized uh, for the next quarter so that they can make the bonus and retire, uh, and if the investors are shorting your stock uh, as a way to kind of, uh, you know, create a certain outcome, uh, then everybody's thinking in a short term way and it's very hard to kind of think long term. And so if you can create and if you can change incentive uh, structure 
uh, and, and companies kind of sign up and investors sign up uh, to, uh, on that, like then you could take the same kind of private mentality and apply into the public markets. And that's what uh, LTSC, which is one of our portfolio companies, is attempting uh, to do. Um, there is clearly data that the second richest person in the world, or third richest, I don't know where he stands uh, today, but uh, has made a huge amount of wealth thinking long term. So that works. Uh, you know, that, that's like it's all about people, people on the board and management teams kind of wanting to build something, uh, something which, uh, which they are proud of in, in 10, 15, 20 years and, and create benefit from that. Great. So we have one more moderated question before we move to, to the questions from the floor. And let's pivot back to private markets for that. So what are the biggest opportunities for shared value investing in the venture capital and, and private equity spaces? I think, uh, you know, uh, this industry has become, you know, compared to, to the time when I started in 1992, has become really a, a huge industry. And uh, that can actually forge new paths and, and actually can leverage an uh, important amount of uh, money uh, into the direction that we're talking about. You know, if we look at uh, society today, and I, you know, I, I'm just a small entrepreneur at the end of the day, but it's, it's very clear that, you know, the balance of things today is not satisfactory to many stakeholders. And uh, if we do not try to bring a, a certain percentage of the amount of money that uh, we manage into that direction, uh, I think that philanthropy by itself is not going to be enough. I think there is an opportunity for the private equity business uh, to realize uh, that, uh, you know, uh, having a vision about where the company is going to land in five, ten years' time, uh, uh, taking itself to the dimension where, you know, you actually, even when you sell it, <laughs> Uh, uh, it can be part of a, a good reputation to sell a good company that still performs well after you leave because you have directed it into the right direction, you have put it into the right direction, is uh, one, one, uh, one, uh, one element that can actually make makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, no, uh, again, as I've mentioned, I think technology is, is going to reshape every industry. If you think about uh, the first innovation in, in internet uh, or, or in, in, in technology was in, in our world, which is the information technology, uh, was uh, when, when you invented, when, when the PC got invented, you created Microsoft uh, from that. When all the PCs got connected together, the Google got created. Uh, when a, a supercomputer went into each of our pockets, uh, uh, Facebook uh, and Twitter uh, got created. When everything gets connected, uh, when, and which is going to happen, then you can reshape every industry. I think that's what's coming, which means individually you'll be able to, uh, you know, be able to offer pers uh, everybody a personalized choice and empower them. Uh, all resources which get wasted uh, uh, you, you, can, you can reduce, uh, reduce that. Um, if, if you think about um, uh, human health, right, like how do you can really understand genetics and genomics and, uh, and, 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 and help uh, and, and change healthcare for better. Uh, so, so that's what's coming and that's the opportunity uh, to, to kind of re rethink our systems in well positive ways. Great. So we'll take the questions from the floor three at a time just to try to get more, more, uh, more done. Um, so the, the first three or the top three are, what do entrepreneurs bring to the table that other business leaders cannot? The second is for exclusively Vishal, you see technology reshaping most industries um, and how do we set boundaries on the tech sector? The third is, are, bus are the businesses that you invest in and their stakeholders aware of the shared value language? We'll let uh, Vishal kick off on, on these three. So the, what do entrepreneurs bring to the table that other business leaders cannot? I think entrepreneurs, I was going on a walk with one of my associates, they are, entrepreneurs are a very special breed because they see something which other folks don't and they are crazy enough to kind of go and leave their cushy jobs to just live the dream. And, and, and that kind of dream and that passion and, and 100 people saying, are you crazy? still going and living it uh, and eating uh, ramen or ramen noodles uh, till it works 
uh, like that's what entrepreneurs bring to the world. You know, if you th think about the last 100 years, I think it's entrepreneurship which has solved the biggest problems uh, which we've had. And, uh, and, and they are just rare breed. Like, I, I think more I hang with them. And they are dysfunctional also, like human beings as well, because, the, the, you know, it's just not very easy to be an entrepreneur against all odds, against all these wonderful mega companies sitting in this room building something uh, out of thin air, you know. So that's what entrepreneurs bring to the world. Great. Well, actually, I'm going to take uh, the opposite side uh, because uh, that, that is a uh, very the opposite side in the sense uh, of you know a, a, a different look uh, at, at the issue because it, it's no doubt that entrepreneurs are both courageous but actually people that actually can make a difference because you know they can imagine or they can see things that other people do not see but mostly they do have the courage you know to bring it forward despite all odds and despite you know many times they are discouraged by the banks, by everybody else. Uh, but, but and, and I go back to the, the, your latest question uh, about what can private equity bring into this world. Uh, I, I think the limitation of entrepreneurs sometimes becomes uh, the fact they are so successful, they cannot accept any form of change in what they do. And eventually, because they have been successful with a given formula, they try, they tend to stay attached to that formula for too much of, of a long period of time. And that, for example, what we're seeing in the mid-market today, in Europe in particular, that you see all these guys that have been very successful, but in reality, in, during this uh, transition where new technologies come, disruption is coming, uh, they are an inner force that is trying to protect the past more than looking to the future. Uh, so I, I think that private equity in the long term can be a player in uh, taking many of these very good ideas and give a new entrepreneurial reading without being an entrepreneur itself. Great. So let's move on to uh, whether your uh, portfolio companies understand your shared value language. And we can have Al Alessandro kick off. We, we're trying to educate it, uh, but uh, Professor Porter is uh, very right when he uh, said that today we are, well, like, uh, at least, well, I'm very happy from what I've seen uh, you know, that happened yesterday, but I was the day before yesterday, so I didn't see that. And, 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 and the, the, the feeling is that, unfortunately, still too many people are considering this corporate social responsibility, and they don't really see it as a strategic element that should be in the company. We're trying to educate it. We do majority, so we actually do it. And we have a few cases in the portfolio that have been a good demonstration that the two things uh, are not against each other. Yeah, I think uh, we, we only invest in companies who have ambitious purpose. Uh, and, and by nature of their purpose, I think they are redefining an industry. Uh, and, 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 and so that's the only reason why we'll invest in the company. So yes, they, we don't use the word shared value, uh, but we, we use like, what's, what's the purpose? Uh, is there a way to kind of rethink food? Uh, industry? Is there a way to rethink what is future of work? How would AI augment human beings rather than replace human beings, right? Like, I think those are kind of things which we have discussions with. And once we feel like, hey, they have the right vision, uh, that's, that's when we invest. Great. And then the last question from the floor was for Vishal only, and that was on boundaries on the tech sector. Yeah, no, I think that's a very uh, a pertinent question because uh, I think even people in the STEM world, um, the technology, like when technology grows exponentially, people who are even the developers of those technologies don't understand what could be uh, its effect uh, in, 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 in future. And so it's very important, I think, and one of the initiatives uh, we are working on in, in Valley is, is how do you bring uh, philosophy and, and values uh, into these companies and how do you train STEM-oriented folks who are such engineers to, to this other field. Um, and and, and that will be critical Like uh, as, as, as these companies become mega companies on how do they have, uh, you know, they, they need to have that element of, of thinking about society um, and, and its effect. So, so it's, a, it's a big thing and we think about it a lot at Obvious. Great. So Vishal and his introductory comments 
mentioned two really powerful examples of shared value companies in its portfolio. One was a mining company, and the other one was focused on diabetes. So let's all be inspired and have Alessandro share with us the strongest shared value um, example in your portfolio. Uh, probably I would mention uh, Farnese Vini. It's a winery company, Southern uh, Italian uh, wine company. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess m very many people do know that Italy, you know, produce good wines. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at if you look at uh, most of them uh, in, in the international tables, uh, they, they come from the northern part of Italy, which is quite strange because in reality, you know, the right climate, you would find it in the center and south of the country. So we found, we, we, we saw an opportunity into this company that it was mostly wine from the south. And uh, because of this reason, we say, well, why can't this company be competitive into the international world? So we, we, we try to apply a new business model where we educated uh, smallholder uh, or grape suppliers uh, to run their business more in a professional manner. And uh, th that type of action, that type of educational action, uh, turned out to be a, a big advantage of a company for two reasons. First of all, the company could enlarge uh, the scope of the product range uh, in a very important manner. Secondarily, this uh, small community and uh, this small uh, 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 farmer uh, uh, could actually, you know, learn more about the business, uh, keep the passion in the, in, in the work in, in, into uh, grapes uh, uh, field and, uh, and, and, and therefore develop, uh, you know, a, a local business uh, uh, which, uh, which could be very fruitful. So it was the Southern concept, uh, an industry that was not developed but became developed. Uh, then, uh, uh, in, in, you know, the, the, the part of the business from the wine tasters, uh, uh, the enologist, uh, uh, instead of having just like one big guy, uh, seven younger guys, a little bit in competition, not an exclusive manner, doing the testing and therefore doing the testing in uh, other countries in the world uh, and, and, and therefore enlarging uh, the ability of the company to address the international market. Uh, results uh, of all of this uh, in uh, three years, uh, the, com the company uh, uh, more than double the turnover, more than double uh, uh, the profit, 93% uh, uh, export, uh, and, uh, and uh, the workforce uh, uh, increased by 200%. Wonderful. Thank you, Alessandro and Vishal, for an inspiring and rich discussion. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bhakti, Vishal, and Alessandro. Next, I wanna bring on uh, Clifton Leaf, the editor-in-chief of Fortune Magazine, and Roger Ferguson, the CEO and president of TIAA. Uh, you know, obviously we've been proud for the last three years to have a partnership with Fortune Magazine around the Change the World list, and we'll have a, ch a chance to talk about that later in the program. Uh, but for the time being, please uh, join me in giving a very warm welcome to Roger and Cliff. Thank you, Justin. This is us. This is us. So um, I just want to say that uh, just a, a quick word about the inflection point. So we at Fortune talk a lot to CEOs, to businesses, to people within uh, C-suites and, and those coming up into the ranks. Um, and not as much as Michael Porter, but we, but we do talk a lot to those CEOs. And, and we can see that that conversation is changing. There's no question that the link between uh, core businesses and the ability uh, to do social change is stronger than ever. And more importantly, the link between the uh, profit motive and the need to address uh, multiple stakeholders is stronger than ever. So we actually see that. We see it in our Change the World list. We see it in our CEO initiative. Um, 
And it's become such a big part of our mission at Fortune. Um, and Roger, you've been a part of all this, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we think that inflection point has actually happened. Um, we think that this is that the business itself at, at, a, at a global level, uh, the Change the World list is global, the CEO initiative is global, um, is already transformed um, and, and recognizing these issues. So with that, you know, we've got Roger Ferguson. Uh, you have more Harvards after your name than, than I don't know what to do with it. You have Harvard <laughs> undergrad, Harvard Law School. You got your PhD in, uh, in economics from Harvard. Um, you also have a bunch of other, you know, gold-plated names. McKinsey, the vice chair of the, of the Federal uh, Governors, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. Um, you've had a, a rather, it, it was seemingly gilded perspective, and yet you grew up son of a army cartographer and a public school teacher. Right. You're, you work, studied your way through Harvard. What was your job there? Well, my first job, um, and people have heard this, I was a member of what's called the dorm crew at Harvard. And for those who may or may not know, that job is basically to clean bathrooms. I see it scrubby up here with thumbs up, right? Scrubby. We, are, we call ourselves scrubbies. Scrubbies, scrubbies. Um, yeah. So for the first year or so at Harvard, I cleaned bathrooms, and I was an mm -hmm. awfully doggone good bathroom cleaner. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, uh, some of my classmates sent me a letter commending me on how well I had cleaned their bathrooms. Unfortunately, that letter is not in some archive someplace, but nevertheless, that's, that was how I began. But how long did, I, I, my understanding is you did this like two hours a day or something? Like right, the work study jobs were 10, yeah, two hours a day for five <laughs> days a week, so 10 hours of clean Harvard freshman bathroom. So, I, you know, I think it's important. What could be more delightful? Because, <laughs> because your role, and I, I think about this um, at TIA, is, is really a steward of the middle class. I mean, the right. people whose, whose finances you protect and take care of and grow, importantly, hopefully, uh, are, is one of the largest bastions of, of the middle class. And I think that one of the key things that we heard earlier was one of the goals, we think about ESG, we think about you know environmental issues, but one of the key goals of social responsibility is making sure people get on the economic grid, that they have financial stability, that, they're, that there's more inclusion in financial uh, wealth in, in this world. Um, and so this is something that you live and breathe every day. Well, absolutely, and it's not just me, obviously, but uh, for those who don't know, TIAA has been around for 100 years, literally, this is our 100th anniversary. We were started in 1918 by Andrew Carnegie, who was on the board at Cornell. Right. And he observed that all these faculty members were making less than his average clerk and were retiring into poverty. And so uh, our company, in some sense, before the shared value concept was invented, really is a shared value company. Mm -hmm. uh, and the goal is to, uh, to look after the financial well-being of not just the you know, the tenured faculties, the Michael Porters of, of the world, but also the buildings and grounds keepers and the librarians, et cetera. And so you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. in many ways, we are the stewards of the life savings for people in the not-for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we serve 15,000 institutions, uh, about 5 million Americans. Um, and we very much think of this as being, you know, a shared value, mission-driven organization. Now, we have the advantage of not being publicly traded, and so the short-term pressures that you heard earlier, mm -hmm. earnings per share growth are not part of our DNA. What is part of our DNA is good, responsible, long-term investing, looking for you know, a, a superior return for the life savings of, as you observe, many fundamentally middle-income uh, people in the, in the U.S. But you actually have literal shareholders. I mean, those who, who put their savings into Absolutely. TIA accounts. And those shareholders, you've actively engaged in the question of social responsible investing. I mean, you've Absolutely. actually, in fact, I think more than any, I, I can't think of another uh, uh, financial services group that has, has spent more time thinking about this. No, that's absolutely right. So we are, were one of the first to have socially screened accounts mm -hmm. um, uh, back in 1990. Uh, in the, I would say in this room, in the more traditional ESG sense of the word, and responsible investing mm -hmm. broadly, uh, we've signed on to the UN principles for responsible investing. Uh, and the uh, majority of our assets, I would say, are screened with that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, though relatively small, uh, we're large in real assets, but we try to run our real asset portfolio in a way that would make people proud. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have examples of, uh, we are one of the largest, maybe the largest grower by acreage of uh, wine grapes in California. So you just heard a little bit of an ad for yeah. Italian wine. This is a theme. I'd, I'd like to this is a theme. Think about, you know, California. I'm hoping this is show and tell. I'm hoping we well, get to. Well, we will, uh, uh, we'll tell without okay. show. All How right. is that? All right. Um, but we, uh, during the course of the, 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 uh, the drought out in California, we were uh, recognized for using recycled water to, uh, mm -hmm. to irrigate some of our land. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we also try to use, um, we have a video of using uh, folks who have autism uh, in, a, in, in a way to help you know, cultivate some of the land to give them meaningful jobs. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of different examples. It's not just the literally hundreds of billions that we have that have been screened in a responsible way, but mm -hmm. also some of the smaller examples of trying to run a large portfolio in a way that would make our participants proud. So just to put this in perspective, it's 635 billion that, uh, right. that you have in terms of socially, that have been screened for socially responsible principles. Right, that are consistent with UN principles of responsible investing. So right. that's, that's uh, so about 600. $635 billion. That's a, that's a fairly large chunk. It's a Is fairly it, large chunk. Do you look uh, at Larry Fink's dollars and say, I wish I had that? Or, <laughs> I commend what Larry's been doing. <laughs> I am really proud of what we've been doing to lead the charge in responsible investing and with this long history of doing this from the very, very beginning. So there, you, you've done these surveys, and one of your latest, largest surveys was asking your own constituents, these teachers and janitors and groundskeepers and Professor Porter, um, you know, what, what they want to do with their money. And, and a very large percentage of them actually want to have these principles in place. Absolutely. So we did the survey, as you point out, yeah. and uh, approximately 80% of the folks who responded said, you know, they liked the thought of having some, if not all of their money, invested in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side is um, they also want to be profitable. Right. And so we also look to see, well, gee, are the, is there any, any inconsistency in terms of returns for some of our screened, our socially screened uh, investments mm -hmm. versus the general portfolio? And the answer, you know, the good news is that we see no degradation in return based on uh, the difference between a responsibly screened account versus others. And so I, we believe we can look our you know, people saved with us uh, directly in the eye and say, we, we think we can deliver both. You know, a, a, investments you would be proud of and a good return because after all, we are in the business of making people's money grow yeah. so they can have bigger nest eggs when they retire. I mean, that's fundamental. I mean, you know, this issue that obviously this is their money and they, that's probably fundamentally what they want. What was interesting was to see this gap between what younger, um, of, of your <laughs> constituents wanted and what some of the older ones wanted. Um, and right. the, talk a little bit about that, if you would. Well, look, I think there's a bit of a gap. Um, and we do see you know, younger people, in some sense, I would use the word being more idealistic yeah. without, without overstating it. Um, but that's not to say that our uh, more mature participants have left that as irrelevant. Mm. I think the reality, in all honesty, is Younger people also have the advantage of you know many many years to grow. So what Einstein I think it's Einstein called the miracle of compound interest. So if you're starting to invest at 20 or 25, um, you know you've got 60 or 70 years ahead of you of investing opportunity or maybe more. And that's a slightly different time frame than if you're thinking about this at the age of 50. That's Have, the squared in EM E equals mc squared. squared. Right. That's, there you go. <laughs> anyway. uh, but I think we should be careful and not. Uh, sort of creating stereotypes that you know, one group of people is more interested in this than others. I think my observation, at least for the participants that we work with, is ev everyone has an interest in it. Mm -hmm. And the challenge and opportunity is to figure out how to bring that interest to life without, again, you know, underplaying the, the returns. And so I think the most important message is what used to be called the double bottom line, if mm -hmm. you will, um, is something to be, uh, to be recognized. The other thing that's really important for us is that you know, we are uh, a shared value organization. As you say, we have no outside shareholders other than those who share, who save with us. Mm -hmm. And so our entire interests are totally aligned. You know, we only exist to make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that by- How can you uh, live with uh, yourself? How can I live with <laughs> <laughs> um, you? It was interesting that the younger non-SRI investors, one of the, th the things that they had said in the survey was, 
they were more interested in human rights than they were in natural resources. And I thought that was really interesting because the gap is pretty enormous when I looked at the numbers. It is. Statistically, it's quite I think so, but uh, again, um, I think a lot of this is driven by what I would describe as a crisis of the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, not to, in any sense, stereotype or denigrate one point of view versus the other. Um, you, know, I, you can easily understand, given what one reads in the headlines, that human rights issues are mm-hmm. most prevalent. They're most mm-hmm. immediate. Um, uh, you know, it's easy to visualize them. It's a little harder to visualize some of the things that are you know, more likely to unfold over a period of time. And so you know, a challenge here is to think about the distinction between um, acute mm-hmm. versus chronic. Right? So human rights violations are in the newspaper. Those are acute. You see people you know, being dispossessed on a daily basis uh, and out of some countries. Uh, chronic uh, is something that unfolds over a longer period of time. And our job is actually to think about both, mm-hmm. I believe, um, because you know, we invest now about a trillion dollars. And so um, you know, I am aware that there's some people who are investing with us at the age of 20 who will be with us until they're 100. Mm-hmm. And their interests and concerns are going to change over time. So our job, I think, is to imagine how people's interests might migrate over time and have opportunities for them to invest as their interests evolve and change over time. You know, some of those people are, are actually out marching now. Um, you know, you have teacher strikes in West Virginia and Arizona, and it's spreading. And there's this a, a great awakening, if you will, in terms of, you know, the teachers who are not just demanding for themselves, but for their classrooms right. and for others. I, it's hard for you not to get in, uh, to have a stake in this, right? I mean, you have a stake in it, to get a uh, Well, we have a stake view. in the sense that we serve, you know, a number mm. of different academics. We don't, what right. we don't do is the kinds of uh, public retirement plans that are the ones in Oklahoma and other places that are, okay. that are under uh, are question right now. Having said that, we think we have a broader stake, which is, I believe, personally, this is mm-hmm. my personal view, we can be a model of what a really good hybrid defined contribution, defined benefit retirement plan looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the things that we do and the things that our uh, institutional uh, clients do to create safe and secure retirements, I think stand as a beacon for what should happen. Mm-hmm. So everybody should be enrolled. Um, you know, there should be a match. Uh, people should be encouraged to participate. Um, though it doesn't happen everywhere, as you make more money, the ability to save more. Um, you should have uh, you know, a broadly diversified portfolio available. You should get good objective advice. The things that we stand for, we believe, should in some ways be you know, the, the, uh, the, the shining city on the hill, if you will, mm-hmm. of what really first-rate retirements look like. We don't do this for everybody. We can't, but we think we can be a model of what uh, you know, good retirement savings and investment looks like. And, and how aggressive are you or active or focused are, are you in terms of reducing the gap between the haves and have-nots in this retirement um, uh, savings? Well, we, we believe that we run our program in a way to ultimately reduce that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, now we recognize that one of the big challenges between what you describe as the haves and have-nots has to do, frankly, with you know, uh, their educational opportunities and you right. know, the jobs that they have. They're things that we can't do uh, to you know, bring the average salary of you know, the Brills and Grounds person up to that of the right. tenured faculty member. However, what we can do for everybody and what we do is provide advice for those who have more complex needs, even if they don't have you know, mm. a big balance sheet or a big income statement. And we put a lot of weight on something else that's very important, which is financial literacy. Um, and so, you know, though you, I can't necessarily drive the average salary up or down for any particular group, what we can do is hope that they can, with us, be better stewards of their money, i.e., you know, good advice for people who have complex needs and uh, a real focus on financial literacy. One of the things I'm really proud of, and I know I'm giving long answers. No, no, it's perfect. I want everyone to yeah, understand. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, is the work that we do with uh, women, for example. We do women's empowerment conversations. Right. Um, and we've seen that that gets our women participants to uh, take more responsibility for their outcomes. We do counseling in, uh, in Spanish, for example, where that's relevant. 
And so, you know, we're trying very hard to also reach out to, you know, disadvantaged groups in a way that uh, hopefully gets them more engaged in their financial lives. You know, one of the key themes in the Change the World list and in the CEO initiative are are basically uh, inclusion and diversity and making sure that there's uh, gender equity, uh, racial equity, um, more inclusion in boards and in corporate, in, in corporate domains. Uh, it would be crazy not to mention the fact that we now, uh, we're about to come out with a brand new Fortune 500 list. Uh, there are three African-American CEOs. Um, you are the longest serving of them. Um, only two of them are in the Fortune 100. Uh, you and Ken Frazier, um, the third Marvin Ellis and a JP, uh, JC Penny. Um, you know, this is uh, in 2012, there were six. This is the lowest level since 2002. Um, we have, we still have a, a diversity and inclusion problem in, in the corporate world. Oh, there's no doubt. So, yeah. look, one of the great things about our company is that uh, DNI are in the DNA of the organization. So, we had our first woman. We call them trustees, but directors mm -hmm. in 1940. Uh, we had our first African American in 1947, I'm sorry, 1957, 1958. We had our first African American officer, uh, uh, therefore the first African American officer of any major insurance company in the 50s as well. Um, and right now on our board, um, just short of a third, maybe going to 40% are female. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so this is something that's very important to us. And we, we uh, think it's sort of central to success, not just for us, but right. in, in corporate America overall. There's a lot of data that is starting to show uh, that more diverse companies with diversity at the top uh, are getting better financial returns as well. There, there is a lot of data. And it's funny, you know, we've written about it many, many times. Um, we've shown the data. Why is this so hard to get people to accept? Because you would yeah. think there are still some boards with no women on it. Um, as I just laid out the numbers in terms of, 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 of blacks and Latinos uh, is actually uh, another uh, scary low number. Um, you know, why, why is this such a hard message to get out there when it's so clearly in, in sh uh, shareholders' interest? And I'm not sure it's a hard message to get. I think what the issue, the challenge is then the execution. Right. And what we've learned in our company, and I give my um, independent chair, Ron Thompson, a lot of credit, is you have got to, uh, the leader, the leader of the board, the leader of the company, has really got to hold um, the HR people and the outside executive search firms accountable mm -hmm. for bringing in diverse slates. Um, and so we have just appointed two women to our board, both happen to be African American women. Um, and you know, our chairman was insistent that we not make these appointments until we'd seen a really diverse slate and frankly moved away mm -hmm. from the notion that it's got to be a former CEO, right? Because right? you know, recently retired CEOs by definition right. are, are white males. You just pointed out some statistics. Yeah. Um, and recognize that there's deep value you know, across the C-suite. And I'm really uh, pleased and proud of the folks that we just appointed. So the issue is not talking the words. It's how do you actually at the leadership level decide we are going to make a difference in this space mm -hmm. by looking for diverse slates, uh, by just defining uh, competence in a broader way, and by not going down sort of the relatively easy path of setting a board of recently retired CEOs and CFOs. Yes, yeah, no, that is, execution is a challenge. We have some great questions here. What was your reaction to the Fink letter, and can you contextualize the conversations that you have with leaders of other investment management firms on this? Right, so look, I was very pleased, and we were very pleased to see uh, Larry Fink join you know, us and others in thinking about this issue. Right, um, Johnny come lately, yeah. No, yeah. I didn't yeah. say that, you no, said no, that. No, no. <laughs> What yeah. I said was, we're pleased to see Larry Fink yeah. join us and yeah. others That's right. and folks in the industry. Just issue. check, yeah. And the reason, um, because frankly, you know, uh, we engage, we do relatively quiet engagement with our uh, companies, you know, one on one, talking to CEOs, CFOs, et cetera. Um, the fact that it's now you know, risen to a higher profile, I think, gives all of the uh, companies in which we invest in others a sense that it's not just that do good TIA company that's been around for 100 years with our reputation, but you know, it's, it's others as well. And you know, to give Larry Fink a lot of credit, he is a hard-nosed business person who has grown something from vision to success. Mm -hmm. uh, and having him, having us, having other asset managers all 
singing from the same page uh, is really helpful. So, you know, I, you know, when Larry wrote his letter, I said, you know, good, that will help us and others mm -hmm. show that this is a more credible issue and it's not just this sort of do good TIA working, you know, representing all those teachers, but others who are in a more profit oriented world yeah. care about these issues. So I thought it was very good. You, you mentioned, you know, you're chairman, but you're, you also sit on a number of boards, including Alphabet. Mm -hmm. um, how have you helped bring the shared value message into that board? Is this something that well, you... What's very interesting about Google and Alphabet, I'm not here as a spokesperson for them but at all. At all. Uh, but one of, one of the things I've observed about them is they think of themselves as very mission-oriented. Mm -hmm. They think of themselves as very much bringing you know, the democratization power of information to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that their core activity allows you to search for any information that you want and get it back within a, within a matter of you know, nanoseconds that they mm -hmm. time closely is for them an important part of their mission. Um, and so, you know, one should have, to, we heard this earlier on, a lot of the technology innovation that's occurring, mm -hmm. be it small or large companies, and Google now is about 20 years old, which is not very old, starts with the you know, uh, missionary zeal of mm -hmm. the founders. Uh, and I found that Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who are the founders of Google slash Alphabet, mm -hmm. have a missionary zeal. They right. want to make the world a better place using their you know, uniquely capable technology. Um, and so I didn't have to bring that to them. I was surprised to see the degree right. which they were saying, look, we're about fundamentally making the world a better place through their you know, algorithm, algorithmic knowledge. We've got a great question. How much do you rely on indexes such as the Dow Sustainability, the, the FTSE 4, Good, Just Capital, et cetera? Well, I'm, I'll, Amy O'Brien, our Director of Responsible Investing, is here at the lights is. pointing. She has waved in a right. modest kind right of way. There. Can, right there. Yeah. There she yeah. is. Um, <laughs> uh, and the reason I point her out here is that, in fact, we do a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And so, without a doubt, we work with. Uh, with uh, some who do uh, the indexes. We also are gonna, over time, have to gradually more and more overlay our own views and expertise right. on this, because what we've discovered is, you know, sometimes for reasons that we may or may not agree with, some of the index providers exclude a company, and we scratch our head and go, well, wait a minute, you know, that's maybe with a slightly different lens, we'll have a better point of view. So I would think, Amy, is it fair to say it's a little bit of a mix and match, and over time we'll do more. She's nodding her head in the positive way, which is if you're the CEO, it gives you a lot of comfort. Right, that's good. You know, it's important to have the real experts saying, yeah, you've got it roughly right, Roger. Pretty good. Nice job, boss. Yeah, right, right nice job. Uh, I can keep the job for another day. So people often want their retirement funds to reflect their own right. values. How are you ensuring uh, that this is true in such a, a large portfolio? So we give people choice. Um, you know, we have socially screened uh, accounts that are very uh, important mm -hmm. um, for those who say, Look, I don't want just a general investment portfolio. I really care about avoiding X, Y, or Z mm -hmm. uh, activity that, that I don't happen to like. We've recently come out with uh, a green type fund, for example, a low carbon fund that's, I think, very important. And then we look constantly at even the socially screened accounts to say, is this really recognizing what people truly care about? Back to the point about, mm -hmm. you know, we follow the index, but maybe we adjust slightly. And so our goal is to try to meet our participants, we call them, our savers at participants, mm -hmm. where they are by giving them choice. Um, some people care more about some of these issues than others, uh, and so that's how we manage it. Um, if you saw, uh, you know, the financials, uh, very exciting for an oil company that promoted smoking and opioid addiction, and you said, <laughs> is there, okay. Um, so what are the three biggest advantages of diversity on board? We talked about this, but this is a good question. Can you so, lay it out for our, our great Sure. Audience? So look, there's a huge amount of data that shows that systems, ecosystems, are more resilient if they're diverse. There's a, a theoretical economist, maybe a systems analyst at, at University of Michigan called Scott Page, who has written a lot about the resilience of diverse systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this is a, in some sense sort of academic-y, but, you know, the reality of diversity creating strength is important. How does it do that? It does it by avoiding groupthink. Mm -hmm. by getting different perspectives in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no doubt that you know, I believe and most people believe that you know, listening to other voices and being respectful and inclusive undoubtedly allows you to create better outcomes. Mm -hmm. We've also seen, uh, and you've pointed to it as well, uh, data that suggests that 
boards that are more diverse tend to have uh, companies that have better performance, so there's a lot of economics around it. Uh, and, and the final thing I'd say is we live in a broadly diverse population, and particularly if you are running or on a board of a consumer goods company mm -hmm. and don't have you know, broad diversity, you are probably missing um, you know, what's going on in your, in your consumer base and therefore you know, can't be as responsive to your customer needs. So all of that, I think, drives it, even if you ignore the sort of morality of it. There are a lot of good theoretical, you know, practical, uh, strategic business reasons uh, why I think diversity on boards and diversity in leadership teams is important. I just want to ask one last question. We only have time for a few seconds left, but about the importance of financial literacy and how important that is, not just to your constituents and their well-being, but ultimately TIA's uh, uh, success. Look, I think financial literacy is critically important um, because uh, folks have to be really good consumers. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that what we're offering people is in some sense very simple, which is guaranteed income for life. Mm -hmm. But you have to make choices. And so understanding the choices that you're making with you know, good advice, I think is important. We all want to deal with, you know, there's a, a famous TV commercial, an educated consumer uh, mm -hmm. is our yeah. best customer, whatever the right. phrase is. Well, we really believe that. Now, you know, we are asking people to do complex things, and so we give them objective advice. Um, but I also you know, want to make sure that our participants have some skin in the game, some intellectual understanding of what we do, and why we're doing it. And there are places where they have to make decisions. Um, and those decisions should be based on an understanding mm -hmm. of the products and service offerings that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we all feel much more comfortable if you think that you're working with someone who understands the words you're saying, who understands the choices they're making, they aren't following along sheepishly. We think we have, we know we have great products, we think we have great services, we think we're doing the right things for our participants. But I want to have a solid sense that they sort of understand the plethora of offerings and are choosing ones that are right for them, not just with our advice, but based on their own understanding. Roger Ferguson, steward of the middle class. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You very well, much. Well, that's a title. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Cliff and Roger. Now, before we go to break, I want to explain uh, who we're going to hear from. Jennifer Giroux, the Vice President of Insights and Strategy for Bridge Academies when we come back, and put her um, section of the agenda in a little bit of context. Every year, uh, some of the most popular sort of short sessions have been these sessions that Jennifer is, is kicking off for us this year, and they're called our Storytellers. We look for innovative stories from around the world, uh, in her case, uh, working for Bridge Academies, a unique for-profit educational model now growing in several countries, India, Kenya, um, Liberia, Nigeria, and Uganda. And we feature those stories to try to bring new voices and new experiences into the room. And for those of you who have been with us in prior years, you know these have been some of the most inspirational uh, moments, and so we look forward to that. We crowdsource these sections, uh, these sessions from our community. And this year, the four storytellers that you'll hear were picked from more than 60 submissions from around the globe. So we'll now go to a break until 10 after 11. And when we come back, we'll hear from Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> 